Hi folks, Florida Man here. Today I'm doing diplomacy commentary on a game I played on a variant map that one of our most regular commenters here made, based on the ancient Greek world. Shout out to Capybara for preparing a great map, by the way, which he's still fine-tuning, but which we had a good bit of fun on. Here's the map we played on. I played as Troy, which is the purple lavenderish country furthest to the northeast. Directly to the south of me, in the green territory, Ulster played as Ionia. To the southwest of him, Melior played as the island nation of Crete. In the red territory, Play Diplomacy's ice cream guy played as Sparta. To the east of Sparta, Mustache Mario played as Athens, which is colored blue. Just to the west of me, and north of Athens, one of our patrons, Carolyn, played as Macedonia, which is colored orange. And far to the west, Rex played as Epirus which is colored white. Before the game started, we were able to give Capybara our preferences as to which countries we wanted. I got my first choice, Troy. My second and third choices were Epirus and Crete. The basis for my wishes as far as country assignments was that I noticed these countries seemed a little more difficult to attack, whereas Sparta and Athens in particular seemed like they'd be locked into a life and death struggle from the beginning of the game, and neither Macedonia nor Ionia was as secure as I might have liked either, though definitely better off than Sparta or Athens. In the first season, I communicated with every other power. Ionia suggested that if the two of us became entangled early on, we'd be deadlocked, and neither of us would be able to advance. I agreed with him, and I suggested we might want to try to be some sort of a juggernaut sort of alliance, sweeping west as a unified force. My conversation with Macedonia seemed a little less successful. We disagreed over who would get Byzantium, although, as I pointed out, I was optimally positioned to force it if it came to that. Macedonia thought that a unit in Thrace would be useful to keep me from growing too much too quickly, and I tried to discourage that idea as much as I could. I proposed that we could go after Athens together, as Sparta had raised that idea in a message, and I thought that might make a good reason for Macedonia to see me as a friendly rather than an enemy. But she wasn't overly eager for that deal. With Macedonia seemingly hostile, I tried to negotiate with Epirus to get an early attack on Macedonia going. Unfortunately, I wasn't very persuasive there either, and he suggested we go south and then meet in the middle later. When I persisted with what I considered my more realistic proposal, he said it depended on what Athens was willing to do. Unfortunately, Athens was almost completely unwilling to say anything to me in spring. I directly proposed a coordinated attack on Macedonia, and he basically said, maybe later. I tried to discuss Year 1 plans more generally, but his responses were very short and conveyed a distinct lack of interest. My communication with Sparta was a bit more limited than with most of the others, because the Spartan was so far away we just didn't have very much to say to each other. I just made sure to mention the rather surprising fact that there was interest from a couple of others in dogpiling Athens, which I figured would be of some value to Sparta as a piece of intelligence. Crete was also distant, so it was a brief conversation albeit friendlier than I'd had with Athens or Macedonia. When spring 530 BC orders processed, Macedonia opened Thrace, which was annoying but expected. I planned to go after Macedonia first, because I had warned her that I was going to take that poorly, but Ionia to my south had also moved in a way that could potentially lend itself to an early attack on me. I recognized I had to tread carefully. In the west, Epirus opened for maximum growth opportunities, while Sparta and Athens seemed likely, as I'd thought from looking at the map, to become entangled with each other. In retrospect, I'm actually not sure if that impression was because they were genuinely hostile already, or because, again, I think that this particular map does lend itself to that happening relatively easily. To the south, Crete opened toward Ionia, which seemed to suggest I might have an ally if I came under Ionian attack. One of my first messages after orders processed was to Ionia. I just made sure he knew I was paying attention and on guard regarding his moves to my south. It wasn't as though there was anything I could do to him right now, so I didn't make any threats. When you don't have any specific leverage, it's best to just let people use their imaginations and anticipate what you might do if they don't work with you, rather than blustering. On my other front, I repeated to Macedonia something I'd said before, that I could help in an attack on Athens, but not if I was bounced in Byzantium. The implication was meant to be that I'd attack Macedonia if I was bounced out. I also told Macedonia that I wanted the army in Thrace withdrawn. Macedonia asked if that was a precondition to my potential help against Athens, which may have been a fair enough question, 
but in the moment it resolved me to be hostile to Macedonia, and not to help her no matter what else she did. If you're trying to make an alliance with someone, you can't keep an obvious sword over their head while you're doing that, unless they don't have any other options than to work with you. Most people will resent someone having a threatening unit right in their backyard, and I'm no exception to that. That unit in Thrace was, as far as I was concerned, just like a French fleet hanging out for a long period of time in the Mid-Atlantic Ocean would be if I was England. I sent messages to the other powers too. I asked Epirus about his fall plans, but he didn't respond. I communicated with Athens, who confirmed that he felt threatened by the current situation. Specifically, he felt threatened by Macedonia and Sparta's moves. I suggested that he, Epirus, and I could work together and save him from bad old Macedonia and Sparta. But he didn't seem inclined to make any diplomatic efforts to help me pull this coalition together. He just said that any help I might provide would be appreciated. Sparta and I didn't talk much. He just wanted to know what I expected to happen in Byzantium, and I just told him the truth. I would either land in Byzantium, or I would be at war with Macedonia. Finally, I spoke to Crete, trying to suggest we might work together against Ionia. Crete thought Athens might be going after him, but otherwise he was open to working together. I replied that I thought Athens was just going after neutral centers, and that I hadn't heard anything about an attack on Crete. As fall orders processed, Crete made a big, glorious move against Ionia, while Ionia made a big, less than glorious move against me which changed my priorities. Crete's moves landed, capturing an Ionian home center with a convoyed army and keeping Ionia at only three. Ionia's move landed, but failed to give him much chance of actually getting any of my centers. Elsewhere, Macedonia committed units to the Western Front without making it obvious where they would actually be going. The army in Thrace did not block my advance into Byzantium, but neither did it withdraw. Epirus walked into three dots, including Delphi, which he later told me he didn't expect Athens to actually let him into. Spartan moves made it obvious that he was earnestly invading Athens. With the fall, things had definitely changed. There was a fair bit of negotiating in the build phase. Ionia wanted me to let him live on as a janissary dedicated to fighting Crete. I pretended to agree. Crete and I agreed that we had a common enemy in Ionia, and we would divide him up. Epirus and I agreed to attack Macedonia together as well. Things were looking up. I figured I'd grow quickly if I could be a part of disassembling both Macedonia and Ionia, and getting rid of both my neighbors would guarantee my survival into the endgame. With the build phase, I got a new fleet and a new army, which presumably set off alarm bells in Ionia. Macedonia got a new fleet, presumably to use against me or Athens. Athens got a new fleet and a new army to desperately defend his homeland. Crete got a new fleet and a new army that both looked to be aimed at Ionia. I think bothering with an army was probably a mistake, given that Crete was an island and already had my support against Ionia. Epirus built three armies that could only be to attack Macedonia. Sparta built two new fleets, which made a lot of sense, because with Sparta relatively difficult to reach by land, this map seemed sure to make it more of a naval power than it ever was in real life. In spring 529 BC, Macedonia evacuated Thrace, as requested but also made the rather infuriating decision to move a fleet into Thassos. Also, despite Macedonia stating that she knew Epirus must be attacking her because of the three army builds, she moved her other two units inexplicably south toward Athens, leaving the Macedonian homeland less than well defended. I can only assume that Macedonia thought that she had some sort of a solid deal with Epirus that he violated here because Epirus moves everything east to attack Macedonia. I moved everything I could spare south to attack Ionia, Crete also moved everything that wasn't nailed down toward Ionia. Athens and Sparta sparred, and Athens seemed to come out better in this first round, but it didn't seem to mean very much, except a destroyed Spartan army. With the fall, it was clear I had an overwhelmingly strong position against Ionia, with Crete's help, so I was able to send a couple of units in Macedonia's direction, while pressing the attack into Ionia, capturing Ephesus. Macedonia began making moves to defend against the assault from Epirus, but the truth is, Macedonia never had the armies to win that fight, and Epirus had the momentum. This season, Epirus moved into position to guarantee two Macedonian centers next year. To the south, Crete continued to attack Ionia, but Epirus snuck a fleet down to the Mediterranean Sea, putting the Cretan island in danger of a sudden sneak attack. Fortunately, Crete had moved his army to be able to block such an attack. Near the center of the map, Sparta and Athens continued to spar inconclusively. Macedonia and Ionia both had armies destroyed in the fighting. With the build phase, Macedonia rebuilt that army closer to home, while Crete, Sparta, and I built one fleet each. This isn't the last time I'm likely to mention this, but this is a very naval map. 
In spring 528 BC, Crete defended against the apparent aggression from Epirus by capturing Mediterranean Sea himself. Epirus took the two centers from Macedonia that he was guaranteed to get, as I had mentioned last season. However, I had expected him to get the second one in fall, and he was moving even faster than I expected. Also, thanks to Epirus, Sparta began successfully advancing into Athens, taking Thebes. As for me, I moved two of my fleets out to sea, toward the front lines, generally, not committing to anyone in particular. I was thinking about attacking Athens, about attacking Sparta, about attacking Macedonia, about attacking Crete, anyone except Epirus, basically, who was almost unreachable except over land. I was filled with a desire to invade the whole of ancient Greece. At the same time, I occupied Sardis, and Crete supported my unit in Ephesus holding, at my request. The retreats were pretty standard, except Macedonia was able to retreat to Olympus, which was somewhat behind Epirus's lines, and changed the situation there. In the fall, Crete and I finished Ionia off. Macedonia recaptured Larissa and protected Therma from the Epirus attack, and Crete joined in the defense of Athens from Sparta and Epirus. I moved my fleets a bit closer to the front lines where Athens and Macedonia were being attacked. I was still ambivalent on my exact intentions. I didn't want to help someone else grow, but I did want to make sure I would get to eat some more Greek centers, and Macedonia was seeming like a natural target, as well as someone I had already wanted to attack earlier on. I missed the build phase while Crete got a new fleet, Epirus got a fleet and an army, and Sparta acquired a new fleet too. With spring 527 BC, I sent all my fleets west to either defend Athens or attack him, and Macedonia. Crete, Sparta, and Athens continued their dance, with Epirus's help making Athens lose a bit of ground again. Macedonia threw most of her units at Epirus, except one fleet that she moved toward my undefended center of Troy, one of my home centers. It was also right next to the island of Lesbos. I was naturally very annoyed at Macedonia, moving a fleet toward my homeland while she was under attack by someone who was not me, and not under attack by me, and I told her that if it actually touched one of my centers, I'd make sure she didn't see the endgame. Macedonia tried to persuade me to leave the center in her hands, saying she'd destroy the fleet and use the center to keep up the fight, but I didn't choose to see things that way. In fall, Macedonia walked into Lesbos, and I captured Therma and moved into position to take Amphipolis, both Macedonian centers. I also walked into Chalcis, which Athens wasn't able to defend. Athens also lost control of Athens itself, leaving the Athenians with just Marathon and Delos surviving. In the far west, Macedonia captured Aulon from Epirus, which was virtually certain to be short-lived. In retrospect, this is perhaps the moment when I should have made peace with Macedonia and assured her that I wouldn't retake Lesbos. It would have been useful to have those Macedonian units behind enemy lines going forward. But this is the kind of thing that requires discussion in advance, or people who make decisions with their emotions, like I did on this particular occasion, can end up being quite vengeful. And I must admit, I see a bit of a pattern in my behavior now. For me, vengeance is almost as much a part of diplomacy as betrayal itself. Would love to know what others think about this idea in the comments below. In the build phase, I got a new army and a new fleet, the idea being that I would launch an amphibious attack on Epirus while Athens and Crete kept the enemy navy busy in the south. The plan was essentially that I would wage a war of conquest while my allies kept the enemy from growing substantially. Macedonia seemed likely to make a good distraction while she continued to have units, and by the time Epirus had defeated the Macedonian incursion, I would hopefully control the whole east coast of Epirus's side of the map. Spring 526 was a repositioning season. Not much happened except Athens made another push to try and win a territory back from Sparta. By fall 526, however, Epirus and I have finished Macedonia off completely, and a small attempt I make to sneak attack Epirus has set off alarm bells there. This is unfortunate, as it will hamper my future efforts at invasion. In the build phase, I get fleets, which may have been a mistake. I was thinking of supporting my allies in the south when I should have been building more armies to assist in my aggression in the west. Although I will always be strong in coastal areas with my massive armada, the situation is still the same as what we observed when Macedonia and I discussed an invasion of Epirus earlier. It's an effort that really needs a strong land force to support it. Now that Epirus is well entrenched, it would have to be a really massive land force, or a force that has the advantage of surprise. In hindsight, I really made every mistake I could in fighting Epirus. As you can see from the way the last several seasons play out, I do make some gains against Epirus but they're limited by the fact that I am a giant navy, and not all of his territory can be attacked by ships. At the same time, he and Sparta slowly crush my allies in the south, with Athens being eliminated and Crete being invaded on his island. By the end, I stab Crete as well, just to keep from shrinking, 
Sparta, Epirus, and I agree to a draw, since none of us knows where the game would go from there, and I think each one of us thought that we could potentially end up being the odd man out. My final thoughts are that I really enjoyed trying out the new map, I should have done more to cultivate Janissaries when my position had become secure, and I couldn't have asked for better people to play with. Other players also had final thoughts, which I'll share now. Macedonia. My AAR thoughts are that my opening should have been to go east as hard as possible. Going south did not have enough expansion opportunity for how bullish I had to be on allying Epirus. Doing the later switch on Troy was also a mistake, but I don't think it changed what was going to be a very partitionable border between Troy and Epirus. Overall, Macedonia had a bit of the Italy feeling to it. Good game, everyone. Ionia. Kinda got ganked at the start, so nothing really to say. I would say Ionia's situation could probably be improved by swapping the fleet and army in Halicarnassus and Miletus, and making Miletus and Lydia adjacent. Sparta. For my AAR. At the start, I thought Sparta would do better as primarily a fleet power because armies could only head north, still requiring fleet support, and doing so would leave me vulnerable in the south to something along the lines of a convoy to Helos. Even if that were to be successful, I would need a lot of armies in the north to get anywhere, so it would be hard to expand after success there. So unless I got great vibes on other sides, and not so much on the north, I didn't expect to go for armies and go there, at least from the beginning. At the end of the first year was when I had to make a decision of whether to go north or stay on the seas, and I chose the latter. At that point I still had a choice of working with either Athens or Crete, and was open to either. The former would have a harder time of staying together, but would leave great openings to me, and would also keep me safer. The latter could instead stay together to the end. I decided that I would go after Athens, and offer Crete an alliance with myself and Epirus for the length of the game, but he grew suspicious and did not go for it. I did plan on holding to it, but it is of course possible I would not have. At that point, Epirus and I had enemies all along our border, and I saw Troy as an ally to get them from behind, getting closer to getting out of the game, and also potentially leaving me openings to expand rapidly enough to solo. Unfortunately for me, Troy did not join us, and instead sided with Crete while eating up most of Macedonia. At that point, I was worried about a solo happening, as I did not see Epirus holding up. Troy suggested I stab Epirus, but I thought, and still do, that such would only, most likely, result in either a Trojan solo or my own elimination. Crete worried more about Epirus and myself than Troy, and while I attempted to unlock horns with him, it didn't get anywhere. With Crete's NMR, things changed, allowing Epirus and myself room for growth that could bolster my allies' defense in the north. I think that convinced Troy that he could not solo and would lose ground to Epirus. This is just speculation. But we were able to find peace in the north, and the game quickly drew to a close. And here are some changes that the GM suggested for the next version of the map. Please let us know in the comments below what you think of the changes. He notes that he has moved Macedonia closer to Epirus and Delphi. Megara is a canal now, so Athens can contest the Gulf of Corinth. Crete and Sparta are closer, but unlikely to fight in year one. Areas in the north and south of the map are changed so as to reduce stalemating. There are reduced areas in the Aegean. And Epirus and Macedonia can follow rivers to get fleets on the other sides. I have to say, I think these changes would have made a big difference in the conduct of this game. I have a suspicion that... Maybe Macedonia or Sparta's decisions in the early game would have been different, and certainly in the later game it would have been harder for me and Epirus to end up sort of deadlocked in the middle. Also from the GM, tips on designing maps. Go with the flow. Make things balanced, but don't fight against the unique features of the map, i.e. Russia having four centers, stalemate line, Venice Trieste, north-south coasts. Place centers to encourage conflict. Stalemates are boring, and stable relationships should be earned. Avoid juggernauts, and Venice and Trieste being next to each other is probably too much conflict. Don't let people lose home centers in year one, unless they're reckless. Let people have options for openings. Use fleet army placement to balance openings, Marseille and Smyrna being armies solely to help Italy get an advantage, for instance. The more the merrier. Most stalemates happen at three or four players. More players will give time for successful players to grow. Odd number of players prevents factions from being of equal strength. Too many players gives you no control over the far side of the board, and if a soloing player comes from there, it will be too late to stop the momentum. Ancient med is bare minimum, world diplomacy is too many, classic is great. As an aside, I very strongly agree with what Capybara says there about number of players. Stalemate lines. Avoid many stalemate lines that give players an advantage over their neighbor. Make sure large-scale lines have even numbers of centers, so one side doesn't automatically win each stalemate. 
Classic has one stalemate line, but not all maps have stalemate lines, and some have more than one. As long as no one side has an advantage, don't worry too much about it. We also have some general tips from the map designer on how to think about placing powers on a map. He likes to give each power two close neighbors, three slightly more distant but still accessible, and only one that's far away, which strikes me as somewhat similar to the classic map. If you're thinking about designing diplomacy maps, I recommend pausing the video over Capybara's diagrams here and screenshotting them. I'll probably put them up on my blog as well, assuming Cappy has no objection to that, along with this after action report. In any case, I hope you guys enjoyed the after action report. Your continued support makes the new year feel brighter already. Not that I'm the sort of vain alligator who needs continuous praise, attention, and approval of others, but I am willing to see how that feels, so please feel free to give those to me. If you want to invest more in Florida Man Diplomacy, consider joining our loyal patrons and subtitle writers, whose usernames now appear on screen, and help spread our message of conquest and power, I mean love, peace, and friendship, across the globe. Until next time, Florida Man, out.